Welcome back to No Budget Films, and here we are once again with another Byzantine video. Here we will talk about the longest reigning and one of the most badass Byzantine emperors of all time, Basil II of the Macedonian dynasty, often remembered as the Bulgar Slayer. Basil II now may be remembered as a ruthless warrior emperor, hence his title, the Bulgar Slayer, as he literally slayed and conquered the Bulgarian Empire and wiped it off the map. But aside from his rule being one of constant warfare, it also saw Byzantium at its golden age as a medieval superpower, whereas Basil II too was known to also be a capable administrator and reformer. In this video, we will go over 10 surprising facts about the life and nearly 50 year rule of the legendary Emperor Basil II. Now, I have decided to do this video covering Basil II as a result of one of the comments I got on the previous video I made on Justinian I the Great. And since I already covered the most influential Byzantine Emperor being Justinian the Great, then why not also cover the next possibly most influential Byzantine Emperor after Justinian? If you want to know more about Basil II and his times, then please check out the board game I created being Battle for Byzantium, which takes place more or less during Basil II's rule. The link to the game will be found in the description below. Before we begin the video, please don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe to my channel, as your support really means a lot. Basil II is often remembered as the longest reigning Roman Emperor, and this is true because his entire rule as senior emperor was a total of 49 years, from 976 to 1025. However, he actually had a reign longer than this, as he had already been crowned by his father the Byzantine Emperor Romanus II as co-emperor in 960, thus making his total rule one of 65 years. Basil, as part of the legendary Macedonian dynasty, was born as a purple-born prince or Porphyrogenitus in the Purple Room of the Imperial Palace in 958 to Romanus II of the Macedonian dynasty and his wife Theophano, who is said to be an innkeeper's daughter from what was once Sparta. And when Basil was born, his father Romanus was not yet the senior emperor as his father and Basil's grandfather Constantine VII was still alive. In 959, just a year after Basil was born, his grandfather Constantine VII died and thus his father and Constantine's son Romanus II succeeded as emperor, wherein he then crowned Basil, who was only two years old, as co-emperor in 960, followed by Basil's younger brother Constantine VIII, who in 962 was also crowned by his father as co-emperor. If Basil's full reign, counting his time as junior emperor from 960 to 976, was 65 years, the rule of his brother Constantine VIII was even longer by one year, making it 66. Thus it means to say that Basil II wasn't actually the longest reigning Roman emperor, it was actually his brother. However, Constantine VIII only became senior emperor after succeeding Basil II after the latter's death in 1025, all while Constantine only ruled as senior emperor for three years until his death in 1028. As already mentioned, Basil II began his rule as a junior co-emperor in 960 when being crowned by his father Romanus II. However, in 963, when Basil was only 5, his father Romanus died, whereas Basil did not immediately succeed his father as the new emperor. Rather, he kept his position as junior co-emperor, and so did his younger brother Constantine, all while the position of senior emperor passed to the powerful general Nikephoros Phocas, who rose to the throne after marrying the late emperor's wife Theophano. Basil II and Constantine VIII remained as junior co-emperors in the six-year reign of Nikephoros II Phocas from 963 to 969, and in the next seven years under the next senior emperor John I Zemiscus from 969 to 976, which followed the assassination of Nikephoros in 969. The reigns of both senior emperors Nikephoros II and John I were successful ones militarily, that it secured the empire's frontiers for Basil's rule in the future. However, both their reigns were rather short. Basil II may have been influenced by his two senior emperors, who were both warriors to be a warrior emperor as well in the future. However, this was not to be the case, as although Basil finally succeeded as emperor following John I's untimely death in 976, he was not entirely an independent ruler. First of all, Basil remained under the domination of his powerful great-uncle, the eunuch Basil de Capenos, who controlled the court, whereas half of the empire did not support him and instead supported the usurper general Bardas Cleros. Even though Scleros was defeated by Basil II's loyalist general Bardas Phocas in 979, Decapenos still dominated the young Basil II's rule. 
The Capinos, however, would fall from power when being accused of corruption and conspiring with the rebels against Basil II, and thus from 985 onwards, Basil II was literally an independent ruler free from the domination of powerful court officials despite his rule now challenged by the general Bardas Phocas. In 986, the young and inexperienced Basil II, now basically fully in command of the empire, led an offensive against the expansion of the Bulgarians under their leader Samuel, only to lose to the Bulgarians in battle. This defeat of Basil thus led to the general Bardas Phocas to declare rebellion against him, seeing Basil's weakness. However, Basil here was willing to prove he was not weak. Basil II here decided to conclude an alliance with the prince of the Kievan Rus of Vladimir the Great, whose forces had occupied Byzantine Kherson in the Crimea, and thus Vladimir here agreed to evacuate his troops from Kherson, provide Basil with an army of 6,000, and even convert to Orthodox Christianity if Basil was to marry off his younger sister Anna to Vladimir. In 988, the deal was sealed, and once Anna was sent to Kherson to marry Vladimir, in return Vladimir and his men converted to Orthodoxy, whereas Vladimir too sent the said 6,000 warriors of Rus and Scandinavian origin to Byzantium to serve Basil. In 989, Thanks to the strength of these fierce warriors, Bardas Phocas's rebellion was crushed, wherein Phocas had even died in battle. Due to their bravery in this sad battle against Bardas Phocas, but also due to their loyalty to the emperor, they said Rus and Scandinavian warriors had become an institution in the Byzantine army known as the Varangian Guard, which would from here on loyally serve Basil II and future emperors as their bodyguard unit in battle. From the 990s onwards, many Rus and Scandinavian warriors would travel all the way to Constantinople to enlist in the Varangian Guard after hearing stories of how much wealth they would attain and battles they would fight if they joined it. Not many Byzantine emperors get a very detailed description of their physical appearance and personality the way Basil II does by the 11th century court historian Michael Selos, who was born towards the end of Basil's reign. According to Selos, Basil was a stocky man who was shorter than average in height, but impressive to look at when on horseback. Selos too describes Basil to be not an articulate speaker, while also having a loud laugh that convulsed his whole frame. True enough, we too have existing proof of Basil's complete appearance from the illuminated manuscript known as the Psalter of Basil, which is part of the 11th century Menologion of Basil II, compiled by Basil himself and here it shows Basil in imperial armor with the appearance of a middle-aged man with a short beard. Now, Basil too is known to have ascetic tastes, that he cared little for the pomp and ceremony of the imperial court despite growing up with the luxuries of the imperial court as a palace prince. Additionally, Basil had despised literary culture and affected scorn for the learned classes of the empire. Celos too describes Basil II's character to be twofold, as he was a villain in wartime and an emperor in peace, therefore showing he was competent at all times, whether in war or peace. Basil too is said to have preferred the fast life of war and commanding armies wherein he liked to eat and sleep with his troops and wear military attire instead of imperial robes. In the battlefield, he was known to be a strict micromanager who always insisted that his soldiers stay in formation and if they charged out bravely against the enemy, they would not be rewarded but dismissed for insubordination. Although Basil II is best remembered for his successful campaigns against the Bulgarians, he, like his two predecessors Nikiforos II Phocas and John I Zemiskis, also campaigned against the Arabs in the south and east, which is not as well known as his wars against Bulgaria. As soon as Basil took care of the internal threats of Bardas Phocas and Bardas Kleros by 991, he began to turn his attention east to expel the forces of the Arab Fatimid Caliphate, whose presence had been threatening Byzantine Syria. Although the Byzantines initially drove away the Arab offensive on Syria in 993, the Arabs returned to attack Syria in 994 and this time defeated the Byzantine army under the general Michael Burtzis, which thus forced Basil to intervene by leading the army himself. Here, Basil rushed from his campaign in Bulgaria to Syria in only 16 days, and when arriving, they were able to disperse the Arab armies. The Fatimid Caliph Al-Aziz, however, was willing to personally lead the fight against the Byzantines, but he failed to do so due to his death in 996. Though even with the Caliph dead, the war between the Byzantines and Fatimids continued, wherein Basil once again led his forces to Syria in 999. Though in the following year 1000, both Fatimids and Byzantines agreed to conclude peace, as Basil for one had to focus his attention north to crushing Bulgaria, whereas the new Caliph Al-Hakim had to deal with his own internal problems. Ever since Basil II's defeat to the Bulgarian leader Samuel in battle in 986, Basil gained a lifelong desire to crush the Bulgarian state once and for all. 
By the time Basil took care of all opposition against his rule in 991, he immediately began campaigning against Bulgaria, which now had been rapidly expanding under Samuel that the Bulgarians true enough had gone as far as raiding into central Greece. In 996, a Byzantine army under the general Nikephoros Uranus defeated the Bulgarians at the Battle of Sperkios in Thessaly, and as soon as Basil concluded peace with the Fatimid Caliphate in 1000, he then put all his attention on crushing Bulgaria. Here, Basil pursued a policy of gradually attacking Bulgarian territory and annexing land year by year, and true enough it worked as by the same year Byzantine forces had captured the former Bulgarian capitals of Pliska and Preslav, and in the following years, the Byzantines captured more Bulgarian territory in Thrace and Macedonia. In 1004, the Byzantines scored once again another major victory over Samuel at the Battle of Skopje, and thus recaptured the city of Skopje itself, whereas in the following year, Bulgarian held Dirakion and Albania surrendered to the Byzantines. Samuel was thus from here on forced to fight in the defensive position until 1014, when Basil was now in a position to fully conquer Bulgaria once and for all. After years of back and forth war against the Bulgarian Empire of Samuel, Basil II finally had his chance at decisive victory over the Bulgarians in 1014 at the Battle of Clydeon, wherein Basil and his general Nikephoros Siphius managed to outmaneuver the Bulgarian army at a mountain pass. The battle thus ended with a decisive Byzantine victory, wherein it is said that Basil had captured about 15,000 Bulgarian prisoners of war, in which he had 99 out of every 100 men blinded with only one out of the 99 left to one eye in order to lead his men home. Though this may simply be an exaggeration, but he still blinded his prisoners. Samuel, the Bulgarian Tsar, allegedly suffered a stroke and died when seeing his men return to him blind. Whatever really happened here, the Battle of Clydeon was the decisive battle that paved the way for Byzantium's complete conquest of Bulgaria, that just four years later in 1018, the Bulgarian Empire was completely annexed into Byzantium and thus wiped off the map. Therefore, Byzantium's borders once again extended north to the Danube River. The Byzantine conquest of Bulgaria thus made Byzantium feared by other powers that neighboring kingdoms like Croatia submitted to Basil's Byzantium as a vassal, fearing that they would suffer the same fate as Bulgaria and being wiped off the map if they didn't. Although Basil gained the reputation of the merciless Bulgar slayer for conquering Bulgaria, he was still tolerant to his new Bulgarian subjects that he integrated the Bulgarian nobility into the empire's elite and allowed Bulgarians to pay taxes in kind if they didn't have coin. Although famous for his conquest of Bulgaria, Basil II roughly at the same time had also been waging wars with the new kingdom of Georgia in the east. Back in Basil's early reign, he concluded an alliance with the Georgian prince David III of Tau in exchange for giving David lifetime rule over territories in eastern Asia Minor. It was also agreed here that when David dies, his lands would go to Basil, and true enough when he died in 1001, Basil inherited David's lands in Iberia and thus extending Byzantium eastwards. Basil's claim to David's lands, however, were challenged by the new Georgian king Bagrat III and after his death in 1014 by his son the ambitious George I, who then invaded Byzantine Iberia. Once finished with his Bulgarian campaign in 1018, Basil immediately headed east to campaign against Georgia, though he would only launch a full-scale war in 1021. Here Basil and the Byzantine army with the Varangian guard included crushed the Georgians at the Battle of Shrimni and thus forcing George to flee back to his country. George, however, was still intent to crush the Byzantines, that he even supported Nikephoros Siphius' rebellion against Basil, which however failed and thus in 1022, Basil once again crushed the Georgians in battle. This time, George, now defeated, agreed to surrender all the lands he took from the Byzantines back to them, or else Georgia would be annexed by Byzantium the way Bulgaria was. Although mostly remembered as a formidable military commander, Basil II too was a brilliant reformer emperor whose economic policies made Byzantium a rich world power. Here, Basil passed a number of laws that further protected peasants and small landowners across the empire by making it difficult for them to sell their land, but at the same time, also making it difficult for the rich and powerful landed aristocracy known as the Dinatoi to buy land from these small landowners and peasants in order for them to grow their wealth and influence as in the past years, Many small landowners lost their lands due to the Dinatoi buying them off, which further decreased the number of taxpayers who owned lands. Basil's reform here proved to be so effective that with more people owning their lands, there was more tax to be paid which further increased the imperial treasury. Additionally, Basil II more or less got rid of several of the old troublemaking aristocratic families of the empire 
such as that of Phocas and Scleros, and replaced them with new families of humbler origins who then became the new elite of the empire due to their military service and loyalty to the emperor. These new military families that rose to prominence under Basil II's rule included Diogenes and Komnenos, wherein members of these families served as officers of Basil and would in the future produce emperors as well. Basil too took care of the sons of slain military officers by watching over them and providing them with the finest education. For all the greatness Basil II was remembered for, he never in his entire life married and had children. Thus for the 49 years he ruled as senior emperor, there was no empress. As a person, Basil, when in his older years, was known to be so serious in his role as emperor that he had no time to relax, and true enough he too had no close friends, which also explains why he never married. Basil II, to put it short, was dedicated to his empire, but he too was greatly admired by his soldiers who were undyingly loyal to him and certainly willing to die for him. Now in 1025, as Basil had finished his wars against Bulgaria and Georgia, he now began making preparations for a massive expedition to take Sicily back from the Arabs, but this expedition never happened, as in December of that year, the 67-year-old Basil II died of a fever. Having no children, Basil was succeeded by his incompetent and useless younger brother and co-emperor for the longest time, Constantine VIII, whose line would continue the Macedonian dynasty until it died out in 1056. At Basil's death in 1025, the Byzantine Empire was at its largest since the days of Justinian I in the 6th century, and here in 1025, it stretched north to south from the Crimea and Danube River to Syria, and west to east from Italy to the Caucasus. Basil II was thus buried at the Church of St. John the Theologian in the suburb of Hebdomon outside Constantinople, and the epitaph on his tomb says, From the day that the King of Heaven called upon me to become the Emperor, the great overlord of the world, no one saw my spear lie idle. I stayed alert throughout my life and protected the children of the new Rome, valiantly campaigning both in the west and in the outposts of the east. O oh man, seeing my tomb here, reward me for my campaigns with your prayers. And now this is about it for this video covering the life and surprising facts about the Byzantine Emperor Basil II. True enough, Basil II is one of Byzantium's most fascinating characters as he more or less was the kind of emperor who is active in all fields, which makes him somewhat the perfect example of what the Byzantine Emperor was. Cruel to his enemies, but wise in ruling a vast empire with great knowledge not only in war, but in diplomacy and statecraft as well. Now what are your thoughts on Basil II and his rule? Please say so in the comments. Once again, I would like to thank you all for watching another Byzantine video on no-budget films, and please continue to support me and my channel by liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing.